Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Uh, we are busy with chapter four in the textbook of Sengal and Kajar on transient uh, heat conduction. And the first paragraph, 4.1, was on the lump system. And the lump system approach is really a very simple approximation of what typically happens of the temperature as a function of time. Uh, it has many, many li limitations and almost never you can actually apply it in practice. We have just started with the most basic and simple solution that you can think of and then the complexity increases as you go through the chapter. So, for example, now in paragraph 4.2, we are going to look at the transient heat transfer in large plane walls. So that's the PW is for plane walls, long cylinders and spheres. Those three types of geometries. And I'm going to show you what is called the exact solution and then an approximate solution. And what will be different from this approach in comparison with that of the lump system approach is that you can get the temperature anywhere in the body, in the center, or on the surface, or halfway in between. So there's a differentiation in temperature. And that is normally what happens with most bodies when there's heating and or cooling. Okay, so the three types of geometries that will be considered are a long plane wall, and take note of the coordinate system. Okay, so it's like that. And there's the x axis. You can put in a y axis there, it doesn't really matter. But the idea is that this is very, very long in that direction. And we are going to look at the heat transfer from this body. And this body is going to be at a temperature Ti in the center, it's going to be at a temperature Ti on the surface, Ti in between, everywhere it's at a uniform temperature. And then the temperature of the environment is going to change to T infinite. So it can be a higher temperature or a lower temperature. Now I hope you agree with me that if this object is very, very long, then the most of the heat transfer will be through these surfaces. The little bit of heat transfer here at the ends are negligible in comparison to the rest. And therefore, it is a very simple simplification of saying that is one-dimensional heat transfer. The heat transfer is only going to be in one direction, and that is in that direction. And because this temperature and that temperature are the same, the heat transfer in this direction will be exactly the same as in that direction. Do you agree? Okay. And very importantly, this di dimension, the half thickness of this is considered as L. So the width of the plate is 2L. That is just to make the mathematics easier at a later stage. So that is simplification, and this is the case of the large plane wall. Now we can do the same with the cylinder. Also a very, very long cylinder, and there it is, infinite in direction, and of course there's, there are no real bodies that are infinite in the length, but if this diameter is one millimeter and its length is one meter, a thousand, and it is being heated to a uniform temperature everywhere Ti, and at T equals zero you change the temperature of the environment, then most of the heat transfer is going to go through the surface and almost nothing is going through there. So again, we are, con going, we are going to consider the heat transfer as being one-dimensional. 
also in the x direction and this radius is r0. Therefore the diameter of this long cylinder CYL is just to indicate cylinder Okay, so the heat transfer will only be in one direction and the diameter of this cylinder would be 2 or 0, 2 times the radius. Very simple. Now the third and simplest one is actually that of a sphere, like a cricket ball or a ball bearing. Here we choose the coordinate system as R. And here, of course, we do not have to consider an X. Again, we can consider it as an R in the coordinate system. And if you want to, you can put in a Y axis. It's not going to matter. But again, this temperature everywhere is going to be at a temperature TI, an initial temperature. And again, the environment temperature is going to change to T infinite. And T infinite can be lower or higher than that of the temperature of the body. So this is the case of the sphere. Now coming back to yesterday, where we've looked at paragraph 4.1 to the lump system approach. And now in comparison with what is happening in paragraph 4.2, what we're going to do today, here we're going to look at the cases of the plane wall, the cylinder, and the sphere. And we are going to look at the exact analytical solution as well as an approximate solution of, for those geometries. With the lump system, if we look at the temperature as function of time, That would be the temperature anywhere inside the body of this geometry, that geometry, or that geometry. It would be equal to Ti. And at time equals zero, we're going to change the temperature. And the temperature anywhere inside the body, in the center on the surfaces, all the temperatures are going to give the same solution. What's going to be different with the solution of today is the temperature, again, as function of time. Everywhere in the body, everywhere in the body, the temperature is Ti. But now, <coughs> If we choose different temperatures, maybe the temperature on the surface, that temperature is going to drop much quicker than, for example, the temperature on the center line. That's the solution that we're going to get today. Is going to give different temperatures inside the body as a function of time. So I hope you can immediately see the limitations of the lump system in comparison with the solutions we're going to have today. So here we've got no temperature variations and here we do have temperature variations. Temperature variations exist. Right, now how are we going to get these temperature variations? Well, you have to go back to chapter 2 in which you've derived the transient heat conduction equation transient heat conduction equation, which looks like that, like this, partial ddx of k dt dx plus partial d dy, k dt dy 
plus partial v dz of k d t dz plus e gen is equal to rho c partial d t d t where the one t is the capital T which is the temperature and the other t is the small t which is time. I hope you can still remember that equation from chapter 2. <coughs> so th that is actually the equation to be used on any object, and especially if you want to consider changes in time. Now, if we look at the object that we have, we've already discussed this is a very long plane wall, so the heat is going to be transferred only in the x direction. They will be in the y direction and in the z direction, but that would be negligible because of the very specific geometry we are using. So, there are no, there's not going to be any changes in the y direction or in the z direction. So those terms are going to disappear. E j means that heat should be transferred on the inside of the body and that typically only happens in a nuclear <coughs> reaction and we are not considering nuclear reactions now or if we've got, for example, an electrical resistance element inside the body. In this case, we do not have that. So that term is also going to disappear and the K value is going to be a constant. Okay? Therefore, this long equation now becomes almost the most simple equation in heat transfer that can be solved. And people have tried for years and years to get an analytical solution for that. Or we can write it as um, alpha dt dt. Alpha is the thermal diffusive diffusivity, which is the rho c divided by k. So, a very simple partial differential equation, which actually now can be solved. And it was solved with lots of effort. It was solved by, of course, looking at certain boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions that was considered was to say that here on the boundary, on the boundary, the conduction heat transfer is equal to the convection heat transfer. And the conduction heat transfer is equal to minus k partial dt lt dx, which is then equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the temperature, which should be xt, x is equal to L, it's on the boundary, minus the temperature of the environment. So that is the boundary condition that needs to be used. And there are also certain initial conditions. As you know, to solve any differential equations, we need the boundary conditions, and in this case, also initial conditions. And the initial con conditions, we, we look at the temperature at different positions x and time, that would be equal to Ti. Okay. Now we can have a lot of fun doing all these derivations and bringing you back to your mathematics, which you've all done. Now, I'm not going to do it in, in detail. I'm just going to show you the highlights of the solution. But theoretically, all of you should be able to solve this because all of you have passed the necessary mathematics. Okay. Now, the person, Fourier, was brilliant when he solved this differential equation because he actually looked at this equation and he says, sure, this is quite 
complicated because the problem I have is that the temperature, which is now a function of x and t, so anywhere inside this body x, the temperature is going to vary. And not only by position, but also time. It means that all of those are a function of x, l, t, k, alpha. And remember, in alpha, there's actually rho c and k, so it is another 3. But let's make it 1. That's the advantage of writing it as a material property. All these three are material properties. Alpha h as well as temperature, the initial temperature. The solution is therefore dependent on eight variables. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm missing one, but in any case, something like that. Eight variables. What he then did is, he said, well, let me go and non-dimensionalize this equation. Non-dimensionalize it. And I do that by writing capital X is equal to X divided by L. X divided by L. Let's just look at the sketch. There is the x-axis, so when x is equal to 0, 0 divided by L is 0. So on the center line, x divided by L will be 0, and then it will increase until the maximum value, which can be 1, when it is L divided by L. So that was the advantage by non-dimensionalizing it, because now you've got two variables of which you can reduce to 1. <coughs> And he did the same with temperature. And we are going to do it a lot. We are going to work with a non-dimensionalized temperature. And yesterday, we have actually started doing it already with the lump system, where we wrote the temperature at any point in the body minus that of the environment divided by Ti minus T infinite. Again, these values can just, this value, the non-dimensionalized temperature, can only vary between 0 and 1. It cannot be more than 1. It cannot be less than 0. It can't be negative. So, again, three different variables in one variable. And then he defined the Fourier number as alpha t divided by L squared the Fourier number, or also called the non-dimensionalized time. T is the non-dimensionalized time. Now this one can be more than one, so it can change from zero to 50 or 60 or something like that. That one will not always be between zero and one. And then, doing all of that, he could write this equation Let's call it equation one. He then took all this, put it into equation one, and then he could write this equation as partial d2 theta, the x squared, is equal to d theta d time. Okay. So now, <coughs> theta is a function, not the same function f, but another function only of x, the Biot number and the Fourier number. Okay. Now let's just go back to the lump system approach. If we go back to yesterday, the lump system approach, we wrote the non-dimensionalized temperature as the temperature minus T infinite is equal to Ti minus T infinite is equal to E to the minus Bt. Okay. 
where B is equal to the heat transfer coefficient, the area, rho, the volume, and Cp. Now this can also be written as, if you just do a little bit of manipulation, and it is shown in the textbook, can also be written as E to the minus Biot number multiplied by the Fourier number. Okay. Now please, 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 do not go and use this solution <laughs> with that type of bodies. This is just limited to the lump system approach. Now, I'm not, I don't like presenting class with PowerPoints, but unfortunately I have to do it today. So, Sean, if you can just concentrate for us on the screen. So, there's a differential equation, the boundary conditions, the initial conditions, the, non -dim the dimensionless differential equation, then in that format, when, when, where we have now uh, theta is a function of x and tau. You can also go and write the boundary conditions in a dimensionless form as well as the initial conditions and then you can have lots of fun by using the method of separation of variables. You all should know about it and you can get the characteristic values and the eigenvalues and the result is this problem can then be solved by a so-called Fourier series expansion. There's a question. Sir, on, on the previous slide, um, your alpha value on the slide was k over rho c, and on the board it's rho c over k. Mm. I can't remember. You will learn a lot that what I write, say, and mean are three different things. <laughs> so just go and check it in the textbook, please. It might be the other way around. Okay, any more questions? So just go and check that value for us, please. Or it might be you're on the PowerPoint that it's wrong, I'm not sure. Okay. That detail is not so important. What's going to be important is getting to the solution, so that is all part of the fun, and there is actually the solution. So that is actually the solution, and if you look at it, you will see the solution consists of n equal 1 to infinite. So if you guys give me a lot of grief in class, I'm going to give you one of those questions in the test and an exam to do because it's going to keep you busy an infinite number of times. <laughs> infinite number of, of terms that you will have to calculate. Okay. So that is the real solution and these days we can do it very easily on a laptop or for the computer program or numerically but if you clean it up if you clean it up then everything is then summarized in table 4.1 there's the solution but take note there are three solutions so what I've showed to you here on the board the boundary conditions and the initial conditions are for the plane wall only you can go and also do all of that excuse me for the cylinder as well as well as for the sphere. So it is more complicated to, to work in the R theta coordinate system than the X, Y one. So in the textbook it only shows you the one for the plane wall. But now you look at this and you will always, you, you will almost look at it and you would say, but you, if I look at this and that problem that I have to solve, they are so far apart from each other. I, they are all new symbols, <laughs> I don't even know what to do. That's true. Okay, so if you look at it, you'll see that theta, okay, at least theta we have defined is the non-dimensionalized temperature. Okay. But then it's the sum of four times the sin of lambda, okay? And you will look at that and say, but what is lambda? I don't even see a lambda here on the board, you're right. Because lambda you need to get from there. It's the roots of that solution. Oh, and I think there's an equal sign missing there, if I'm not mistaken, here on the PowerPoint. It's equal to the build number. So if we can calculate the build number, we can actually get uh, the lambda values there. I think that should be a lambda and a lambda. 
so then we can get the lambda and the lambda, and then maybe we can solve it. Uh, and then, what is strange, there's even a J0 and a J1. There's a J0, uh, J1, etc. So it looks very complicated. It is complicated if you look at the first time at it in the test and exam. So you need to get familiar with it. But what is very important is here at the bottom, and I've told you that with a previous lecture with the lump system, where we've got that definition of the build number. That definition is just for the lump system. The only place you use it. All the other applications, you go and look how the build number was defined. And here in the fine print, and I'm going to refer to the fine print a lot in this textbook, it tells you how the build number should be calculated. So it tells you there, there's the non-dimensionalized temperature, and the build number is HL divided by K. L in this case is not the LC of yesterday, the characteristic length. It is the half of the thickness of the plate. Okay? And then there's the Fourier number, it's given to you. And J0 and J1 are the so-called Bessel functions. I hope you've also done the Bessel functions, depending on the mathematics curriculum that you did. But even more complicated, of course, with the R and theta coordinate system, <coughs> there you need the Bessel functions also. And the result is then that you end up with that equation to solve. And very next to the solution, you get these tables. Now, how do they connect to each other? What is going on here? Well, be calm. It's not so bad. Okay. So what you will see in this table is a value for the build number, and there is the plane wall solution, the cylinder solution, and the sphere solution. Okay. And for different build numbers, the value of lambda 1 as well as A1 are given. Do you see them? Not very clear on the PowerPoint, but if you look in your textbook, it will be easy to see. So there are the different build numbers from a very small value, 0.01 to 100, for plain wall, a cylinder, and the sphere. And in table 4.3, depending on the value of eta, that is where you have to calculate the Bessel functions, it gives you the value of the first, the zeroth, that is the zeroth order Bessel function, and that is the first order Bessel <coughs> function that you need to replace into that textbook. So what does it really mean? It really means that table 4.1, take note, gives the exact solution. The exact solution. And the exact solution would say theta is the sum of n equal 1 to infinite. Theta is the non-dimensionalized temperature. And we should get it for 4 times the sum of lambda n divided by 2 times lambda n plus the sum of 2 times lambda n multiplied by e to the minus lambda n squared tau multiplied by cos of lambda n x divided by L, where the roots would be the solution of lambda n tan lambda n is equal to the build number. So I even get tired of writing it down. So if you must get the solution, it's a lot of work which means that you're going to end up with a solution where you're going to use n equal 1, and you have to calculate all of that, plus n equal to 2, etc., to get an infinite number of them. And hopefully they will get smaller and smaller so that the contrib contributions will become less and less. So that is the brilliant exact solution by Fourier.
Now, fortunately, he, as well as other people, realized that, wait a minute, after you've done this many, many times, then you start being a little bit more observant. And you can be observant by actually noting that you can use an approximate solution of the above if tau is larger than 0.2. If the non-dimensionalized time is larger than 0.2, you only have to use the first term, which makes it, of course, much more easier. And those are given in your textbook as equations 4, 23, 24, and 25. Those first three solutions there is the approximate analytical and graphical solutions. We'll get to the graphical solutions just now. For lambda larger than 0.2, that is theta for the wall, the plain wall case, theta for the cylinder, there it is, and the theta for the sphere. And we only use and we only need to solve A1, e to the minus lambda 1, tau cos lambda 1x divided by L, if tau is larger than 0.2. So, much less work. And, if I remember correctly, I think they say something in the textbook about it. If you only use that first term, then the solution most probably will be accurate to plus or minus 10%, which is not bad. <coughs> right. Do you all understand? Are you all with me still? So with an approximate solution, you need to see that there's a plain wall case, there's a cylinder case, and there's a sphere case. And in the plain wall case, that in which they say theta of the wall, there they write it as a1 e to the minus lambda 1 squared tau plus other terms. It's equation 423. But what is important is that this theta of the wall are being written as the temperature, any temperature anywhere in the body minus T infinite divided by Ti minus T infinite. Okay. So it is important to note it gives us the temperature at any point in the body. So coming back to the sketch, <coughs> We can decide we want to solve it at x equals zero, which is on the center line, or surface, or halfway, in between, anywhere we want. And we will get solutions like this. We are not going to get a solution like that. So we're going to get different solutions. But then, there's an even further approximation that we can do, and that is for the center line. So if we look at this case, and we make all the x's equal to zero, for example, there's, there's somewhere there's a cost term in here of something like lambda 1 multiplied by x divided by L. If x is equal to zero, then we've got the cost of, z cost of zero, which is 1. So it reduces even further, so that on the center line we can get for the plain wall case, and take note, that is what the zero is there at the bottom for. Zero is where x is equal to zero, so it's on the center line. So on the center line of the wall, then the non-dimensionalized temperature is written as, if we just look at this one, where x is equal to zero, x is equal to zero, so this temperature is where it's on the center line. And this is equation 4.26 in your textbook. 
and the next one is that of the cylinder, followed by the sphere, equations 426, 427, and 428 in your textbook. So there they are. You can see they are so much simpler already. Any questions? So it's very important if this is the plane wall and that is the center line, that is x. So to realize that point there is temperature zero or theta zero on the center line. Right. Now, with this solution of the plane wall, if we make a drawing again of the plane wall, there's the center line, that is x, that distance is equal to L, so the total plate thickness is equal to 2L, If we now go and look at the temperature distribution as a function of time, then if this is the temperature, the initial temperature, and this is the temperature of the environment. Temperature of the environment, in this case, is smaller as the initial temperature, so it means the heat is going to go out of the body. So this body is at a high temperature initially, right through the body, and now there's suddenly a heat transfer to T infinite. What is going to happen with the temperature distribution? The temperature distribution at the walls, the temperatures are going to drop, like that on the wall. So that would be a T equals zero. Okay. Then it's going to drop to something like that. We know that temperatures on the surfaces will be lower. It's going to keep on dropping. Something like that. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I shouldn't have, I should have used that line as T infinite, sorry. Okay, so that is T infinite, T infinite, and then when T is equal to a very long period of time, then the temperature throughout the wall would be exactly the same as that of the environment. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Yep. Uh, when you use the center line equation as opposed to the approximate equation, does that change the accuracy because there's a lambda in between that? Well, again, it is only valid for lambda larger than 0.2. So the center line case is exactly the same as this one because the cost term is just disappearing. <laughs> but again, because tau is larger than 0.2, you can just calculate the temperature on the center line, so it just simplifies it exactly a little bit more, but in principle, the accuracy is exactly the same. Yep? Just for the, um, for the sphere, it will be for the center point. Yep. Yeah, for the sphere, there, of course, T0 would be at the center point of the sphere. So, like a big ball bearing, the temperature exactly in the center. Okay. So of course the mathematics for the cases of the sphere, you can imagine, is much more complicated than that of the plane wall. Mm -hmm. Only the solution of the plane wall is in your textbook. 
but if you're interested in getting the other solutions and working through them, you're very welcome. Okay. Right, so today's class is something that is a little bit unusual because it's just theory and it's very boring theory. It wasn't enough time for, to solve a problem, but with the next period we will solve two problems and then we will consider this part of the work as complete. So if everything works out correctly, it should be on Monday. So it therefore means that your test you'll write then on next week. Is it Wednesday or Thursday or Friday? Something like that. In your test period. Right, thank you very mu much, ladies and gentlemen.